Have you come to the conclusion that there's one major roadblock that's holding you back? And if you could just get rid of it, there'd be blue sky ahead and you'd get what you want. But instead, you keep seeing this movie over and over again, like Groundhog Day. Maybe you're getting first dates, but no second dates. Or there's a certain woman who only wants to be just a friend, even though you have so much more to offer each other. You've gone through a tough breakup or even a divorce, and like I once felt, you have no time whatsoever for feeling like a victim. Or maybe you've hit the ceiling on the corporate ladder. Suddenly, the next level raises fears that were never there before. Or you've relocated and you're out of sorts. Perhaps you want to firm up your foundational identity as a man. Or like so many men, this is simply about regaining your mojo right here and right now after a couple of rough years here. Or, you know, maybe you just can't put your finger on it exactly. All you know is you're flat out frustrated with mediocrity. You feel like you're on the verge, but you just can't cross. If you knew which book to read or video to watch, you'd have done it already, man. But it's as if there's this hidden force keeping you from getting the results you deserve. These are the sticking points that inspired the brand new Giant Leap coaching program. How it works is simple. We identify the area of frustration, get down to the bottom of it, disrupt the living hell out of that pattern, replace it with a course-correcting plan of action, and get going with new mindsets and new habits. This is a real one-on-one coaching program, but since it's so focused and so efficient, it's more affordable than you might think. Giant leap. Step forward and rise above. Go to mountaintoppodcast.com front slash leap And kick this off by telling me what your roadblock is. If you can't name it just yet, yeah, that's fine. Just tell me so and we'll take it from there. Here's the guarantee, gentlemen. We will get to the bottom of this and we will set you on the course towards getting what you want. Mountaintoppodcast.com front slash leap. Live from the mist and shrouded mountaintop fortress that is X and Y Communications Headquarters, you're listening to the world famous Mountaintop Podcast. And now, here's your host, Scott McKay. How's it going, gentlemen? Welcome again to yet another episode of the world famous Mountaintop Podcast. My name is Scott McKay, at Scott McKay on both Twitter and Clubhouse, Real Scott McKay on Instagram. Look up all the video goodies on YouTube by searching my name, S-C-O-T-M-C-K-A-Y. The website is mountaintoppodcast.com, and go ahead and join our thriving Facebook group, which is called the Mountaintop Summit. Today, gentlemen, we're going to talk about a topic where angels fear to tread when it comes to -to man-to-man conversation, and that's falling in love. And I have a special guest with me today. His name is Dr. Gary Salyer. He's from the San Francisco Bay Area, more specifically Concord, California, which is out there by Walnut Creek. And Dr. Salyer is the author of a book called Safe to Love Again, How to Release the Pain of Past Relationships and Create the Love You Deserve. Today, we're going to talk about what makes love last and probably as sort of an ancillary topic is falling in love worth it? And without anything further, welcome, Dr. Gary Salyer, to the show. Thank you, Scott, and thank you for having me on. Yeah, man, listen, it's my pleasure because you're a well-known subject matter expert in this particular area. You've done a lot of work in attachment theory also, which I think we'll talk about. But there's something, you know, that's kind of an elephant in the room here, Gary, and we got to throw it on the table. Although I think an elephant in the room would probably crush a table, but we're going to take that chance. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be the table. I wouldn't want to be the table. (laughs) I wouldn't want to be in the room with an elephant anyway, because they kind of smell funny and are unpredictable. But anyway, enough about me. What I want to ask you is why is love such a touchy subject for guys? I mean, they think it's kind of airy fairy or sort of, you know, something that women talk about. But we as guys do fall in love with women, most certainly. And, you know, this is something that poets and sailors and everybody in between has talked about for millennia. So in your opinion, how would you describe the dynamic between men and our own psyches with regard to falling in love in general? Well, I have two takes on that, Sure, uh, Scott. And I think there was a time 
many, many years ago, 40, 50, 60 years ago, when men pretty much knew what the roles were. I mean, and that applies for both men and women to a certain, to a lot of extent. But we knew that if we went out, we had a good job and we provided, we were all good to go. But the expectations have risen so much that I think a, a lot of men are hesitant because it, those expectations haven't actually been worked out. And the worst part of it is, I think that we have raised the bar so much for love and relationships. But one of the things we didn't do was give people the skills to actually be able to meet those expectations. And so there's a lot of disappointment. Men feel like they can't win a lot of times. They can't make their women happy. And it's a little bit like the expectations out there are like Olympic level skills, but we've been given far less, far less. And for a lot of women who are involved in a lot of workshops, and they're getting a lot more expectations. And I think for men, there's that whole feeling of what does it take to really play this new game of love? And is it worth it? Because it is a higher bar. And then this, the other thing is, you know, women are uh, ubiquitously asking men to have to be more emotionally vulnerable and expressive and receptive. And I don't believe that you and I or most men were given that a lot of permission for that. And so the game has changed quite a bit for us. I know that the major complaint for the women in my in my one-on-one -on -one practice, whether they're coupled or single, is how do I find a man that can feel with me? And that does not necessarily play well uh, when we are trying to come together and create a we. Well, there's a lot there that you're talking about. Yeah. The first thing that's fascinating to me is the conversation being about love. You pointed it towards masculine, feminine roles. Yes. And men being somewhat confused, if not flat out frustrated by the change of those roles, at least apparently based on what the media says, based on what we're mm -hmm. told to think and how we're taught to bend and flex with the change in how women view themselves and their own femininity. And yet I think love itself isn't really talked about in that context. It's more of a feeling, you know, I'm in love with this person. And so two things come to mind based on what you said. First of all, this whole idea of marrying for love, getting into a long-term relationship specifically because of how I feel emotionally towards this woman is something that, although it's been romanticized in the past, in the real world, it's a relatively recent luxury for us to be able to get married for love, for lack of a better way to put it. And then on the other side of the coin, men are told to feel more and emote more. And we're being told that's operating within our feminine. And guys are like, well, you know, I go to these masculinity sites on the Internet and they tell me to be stoic and be this hard guy like Clint Eastwood in, you know, a spaghetti Western. And <laughs> we're left wondering, you know, which way are we really supposed to go here? I mean, I want to fall in love with a woman, but then I'm told I'm weak for letting myself be that vulnerable, a word that you used and that which we use around here quite a lot, frankly. And then we're told the way we're doing it isn't right. So it really is no wonder at all that not only does the word love flat out confuse, intimidate, or even <laughs> straight up disgust men nowadays, uh, it could be because we have a fear of it because we don't know what to do with it or how it relates to what women are asking of us anyway, right? Yeah. Well, I have two answers for that. First off, this whole idea that men being in their feelings is feminine, I, I totally disagree with that. Me too, for the record. We were born for feelings. I remember when I was a young parent and uh, I never had a father so I, I was, you know, kind of observing how does my wife, you know, interact, right? And so I, I emulated a lot. I realized one day that if I want to be a good father, I need to emulate her. And, and I said in my mind, uh, I guess I have to be a good mom to be a good dad. Now, about six, you know, months, a year later, when I've got the hang of this, I realized that, you know, I'm dealing with him because all children, all you can deal with is emotions. That's all they've got, right? Children don't have a lot of cognitive stuff going on. So they're, you're dealing with emotions all the time. And one day I realized, hey, wait a second. This isn't my feminine side. This is just 
what I have been given as a father, as a man, and I've got as much right to feelings as anybody else. And I'm just dealing with my son the way a father who has his feelings does. And I began to really say, what's this whole thing about being in my feminine just because I've got feelings? And that's a good stance to hold because we, you know, we were meant to be able to have our feelings and also to be in our quote unquote masculine. I am always aware of, uh, it's a story that Terry Reel tells in one of his books about the Maasai. He went over one day, uh, one week uh, to spend a week with the Maasai to see what love looks like in, you know, more tribal cultures. And he spends a week and these people, you know, they go out and they hunt lions for, you know, for lunch. That's the sort of warriors they are. And he, one night around a campfire, he asked the, the head warrior uh, through a translator, you know, what is a great warrior? And the answer will shock you. The, this guy, you know, who goes out and, and kills lions for lunch says, well, a good warrior is the bravest of all warriors. And the good warrior is also, when he comes into the village, the tenderest of people. He says, the great warrior knows when to be one and when to be the other. You know, so I think when we look at, you know, where we come from, you know, in terms of evolution, we were meant to be kind at home, but brave when we're out in the world. And I think what's happened is our culture has kind of given us only half a loaf and it's okay to have all of us. I don't look at feelings like there's some sort of fire breathing dragon that I have to avoid. And that's a good thing because the shock of my life as a man was when I was doing all this attachment research, I found out that, you know, what runs the show are four feelings. In attachment theory, which is the science of how your love gets wired to love and be loved, there's something called a strange situation. Uh, it's a famous experiment where they separate uh, children from their mothers about one to one and a half. And from that, we can tell a style of relating that will track for life barring innovation. There can be the secure or the anxious or the avoidant. The secure are comfortable depending and being depended on. The anxious are always afraid when love goes away. And the avoidance are afraid of being depended on or depending on somebody else. They want distance. And I asked myself, so if attachment styles or basic style of relating that will track for life is, is running by the time you're one years old, what's up and running? How do we get back to that? And if you look at it, you know, the prefrontal cortex isn't online, so there's no identity. There's no part of us that says, hi, I'm Scott, I'm Gary, or I'm the listener out there. The hippocampus isn't up and running, so there's no story. There's no logic. The only thing up and running are feelings, and in particularly four feelings. Welcomed with joy, worthy and nourished, cherished and protected, and empowered with choice. And if a man can't track those four feelings, like a good hunter can't track them, doesn't know in a relationship, that relationship will be off. They'll be dealing with unhappiness. It's important that we we kind of revisit and put together the person that can find emotions and hunt for emotions. Because the more we track those feelings in our relationship, the better love goes. You know, Gary, as you were talking, I couldn't help but ruminate upon the truly ironic condition of how we process love and relationships here in the year 2021. You talked about the Maasai, and a lot of people can think of tribal folks in Africa and go, oh, well, you know what, they're primitive, or they're not quite where we are. I have had the extreme honor and privilege of hanging out with Maasai folks, too, not for a whole week but certainly for an entire day and then for pieces of other days. And I have always been in awe of how masculine the men were in the purest form mm -hmm. because their role is the purest of roles. They are the hunters. They are the protectors. They are the providers because they have to be. And as you were talking about how, you know, men aren't really given the tools here in Western culture to be the emotive men at the masculine level that we should be. And, you know, once again, just to be clear, I absolutely do agree with you that men should be emotional. And I think this whole uh, shallow argument that people try to make 
about how men are logical and women are emotional. You know, there are a whole lot of women out there who can be logical as well. I mean, you watch a woman struggling with a terrible two-year-old in the grocery store. She's going to get logical really quickly, telling that kid what the consequences are going to be if they don't straighten up and fly right. Meanwhile, you know, at an NFL football game, when your team scores a big touchdown at the end of regulation time to win the game, everybody in that crowd is going to go nuts, and they're almost all men. Mm -hmm. Where I think it gets complicated is with the sociopolitical agendas that we're faced with, where men are being told that the sky isn't blue, don't believe your lying eyes, your masculinity doesn't matter, uh, by people who have an agenda or who can't relate to masculinity so well anyway, because they're angry women. A lot of these people have been left out. A lot of these people are bitter. Angry people grab the mic. The squeaky wheel gets the grease and they're particularly vocal about their displeasure with how things have been for millennia. And it seems like we hear a whole lot of that, whether we wanted to or not. A lot of guys are like, well, I just don't pay attention. But you know, if you're breathing oxygen in the Western world, you got to pay attention. You'll be forced to. It's everywhere. And yet, to me, the simplicity of life isn't so much non-evolved. It's simply correct. It's simplified. And when you go out and hang with people like the Maasai in East Africa, mm -hmm. you realize several things. When you strip away the complication, you're left with the facts. You're left with what's readily apparent. Uh, when you haven't been taught what alternative there is to what you naturally feel and what you naturally will do with those feelings in your life, you'll kind of do it. And this is passed down from father to son in very uncomplicated ways. The other thing that I want to underscore relative to what you talked about is the Maasai have a very clear rite of passage from boyhood to manhood, which we lack in this culture. And the famous talking points relative to that or how much pain these boys go through and what's expected and how fearsome it is to go through this Messiah rite of passage. And you can Google it and find out for yourself what that entails. But what often is unsaid is these elder tribesmen teach the boys how to interact with women. Mm -hmm. you know, this is the time these young boys are growing hair on their balls and, you know, we're going to have to uh, make sure our tribe continues. So the idea of treating women, interacting with women is part of that rite of passage. We don't have that here in the United States. So a lot of guys are really left with whatever example TV gives them, or perhaps more dangerously, what goes on at school, what their buddies tell them, and perhaps most dangerously of all, the example we're given at home. So there doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of continuity or dare I say, uniform predictability to what we as men learn about women, love, and masculinity. Is there? No, we are not given any that education. And you are hitting what I think is a sore point, especially for men. We're told, oh, make sure she's good looking, right? Make sure she's got an hourglass figure and all that other stuff. But in a relationship, uh, the bottom line for happiness in that relationship is do both people feel felt? Are we stepping into their feelings? And I don't know how many times when working with couples, at the beginning of our work, I have asked a man, what does he feel? And I don't get a feeling word. You'll say, well, I feel that, you know, things aren't going really well. Well, that's not a feeling. Well, and then you ask him, well, how, you know, what are you actually feeling? Well, I feel that things have gone off the road. You no, know, no. Are you feeling sad? Are you feeling angry? Are you feeling helpless or hopeless? These are feelings. And what I try to explain to men, if there was a rite of passage, is that women, you know, they have emotional processors on both sides on their brain. And men only have an emotional processor on the right side of their brain. So we can go into a, you know, a kind of a non-feeling room called the left side of our brain. And that's so that if we're out hunting, we can be logical about that aardvark coming at us or that lion. Do aardvarks come at you? No, they don't. But they do eat a lot of ants from what I understand. That was meant to be a little joke. Oh, but okay. you know, the point being is what I teach men, and it really helps in couples, is that women use emotional radar 
in order to navigate their their relationships, their world. They it's just like radar. You know how radar sends out a beam and then it bounces off an airplane and it comes back. So they ping us emotionally, just like you know the air traffic controllers do at SFO or you know Dallas or anywhere else. And if we don't give them an emotion back, they don't know where they're at in the life. But they don't know where they're at in this relationship and they get anxious or they get angry. It's the same way that when the air traffic controllers at SFO send out the radar beam, if all of a sudden a plane didn't send back a signal and they went off the grid and you couldn't find, you know, Delta 747, that flight, you'd have a lot of anxious or angry traffic controllers. The best thing, the safest thing we can do is when uh, we come home at night and our wife or our partner, or our girlfriend says, you know, how was your day? And you say, well, you know, I had a very disappointing board meeting or, you know, the whole supply chain got messed up today. And when she says, well, how did that feel to use an emotional word back? Well, that felt really frustrating or that felt really hopeless or I felt really angry. If I could do anything for men, it's to give them that one skill to be able to give their women the emotional feedback so they will calm down and know where we're at and where they're at. Women do so much better when we give them that emotional word. Now, whether the Messiah do that in the rules of passage, I don't know. But I know with the increased expectations that's happened on here in Western culture, that would be the first thing. And to give men more of an emotional vocabulary. A lot of men, when you ask them, they only know, you know, three words. I'm angry, maybe I'm sad, and I'm horny. Those are about it. And I literally have a sheet of like 75 words that I often give men because we were not given an emotional vocabulary. And when they get used to it, they find out they're communicating better, their, their women are more happy, and they are getting more what they want because the wrong route to the uh, bedroom is to not share emotions. When, that's foreplay for women. So there's an awful lot of advantages to knowing that when you go out in the world, you can be brave. When you come out at home, you can be tender and vulnerable and share your feelings. In fact, it calms them down and you are way more likely to be in a very good relationship that gives us what we want at the end of the day which is a really great moment uh, to be able to have a woman that wants to sleep with us, that wants to be with us. Well, I think this is all fantastic relationship advice, but I want to go ahead and put the horse before the cart again. Okay. Before any of that has to happen, we have to fall in love and get into that relationship. Yes. In light of everything you've just discussed, would you say that love is a feeling or is love a decision? Because I've heard people make the case for both, and I'd like to hear your side of the story. The glue that keeps love together are the feelings. But we, you know, given that there are no relationships that don't have times of connection and disconnection, a lot of times it comes to be a choice as well. I know in my own relationships that sometimes you don't always feel like going on. It can become a decision. So I think it's kind of both. And I know that love is a set of feelings that we have to give to each other. But it's also a decision. At the end of the day, when you are in a conflict, so many times you have to make a decision. Am I going to go with my negative decision? Am I going to be off the wall with my anger? Or am I going to calm myself down and say something cherishing? So it's both. Well, I think also, in all fairness, people like we've already discussed in this particular episode don't really understand what love was to begin with. Yes. Uh, Less the confusion between two wildly opposite concepts as emotions and decision making. Uh, You know, you make decisions with your heart, you get heart disease, says my mentor, Harvey McKay. (laughs) And we've had guests on this show talk about a lot of the themes that you've discussed here. And I think what makes this show different is the element of what do I do if this has burned me in the past? I mean, I tried to love this chick. She was really hot and I felt really attracted to her. And I don't think I mistook lust for love. I mean, I was really into her. She seemed like she really liked me. And then there was this thing called connection where we really felt each other. And you're one of several hosts who've come on this show and talked about this concept of being felt, which I think is very valid. 
And yet, a lot of times the wheels fall off and we don't feel felt by the other person. Well, we feel like we're doing all the giving and the other person's doing all the taking. And there's this imbalance that causes bitterness and frustration. And, you know, was that even love at one point? Is it still love? How do I make this thing last? Do I even want it to last anymore? Or do we really just both want to throw in the towel and we're being stubborn? And that leads a lot of people to say, boy, you know what, given the statistics and given the complexity of all of this and the uncertainty thereof and just the horrible stories and nightmares that people recount having fallen in love, is it really better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all? Or, you know, should we just go with the men going their own way and the manosphere and the red pill guys and say, you know what, it just isn't worth it? Drown in porn and, you know, get your rocks off without having a real woman in your life to screw it all up. I mean, I can see everyone's point, regardless of which direction they're coming from on this. And, you know, for the record, I don't know if you know this, Dr. Gary Salyer, but I'm very happily married to my wife and I think it is very worth it. And I think my self-worth and my self-work have contributed to an attitude and a knowledge base and a set of emotions that not only allowed me to attract the right woman, but to deserve what I want, which is a great relationship. Indeed, I had to be the kind of man my wife wanted in order for that relationship to be a two-way street and be effective. But, you know, like I said, I think this is very complicated for a lot of people and a very scary proposition, literally and figuratively, to even get into a relationship, wondering whether it's even possible it can last. So what's your take on all of that? I think the major reason that relationships fail, and I talk about this all through my book, Safe to Love Again, is we bring past pain from the past into the present, and that never works for love. I call it the next pays for the ex, whether it's the parents or some other girlfriend or maybe an ex-wife, or we bring that past pain. See, our brain, once we get hurt, it has a negative bias. It wants to look out for anything that could hurt or harm us. And it has this filter, ways I, I will never make them happy again, ways I'll, ne I'll be rejected. And when we come into a relationship bringing in that past pain, we set up the dynamics so that we're protecting about it. And pretty soon we're, we are inviting them into the same thing, that we are creating the, that whole pattern over and over again. I'll give you an example. I work with a woman and she called in a man that she wanted to, to marry. And then we did some, some couple counseling together and things were going good. They were engaged. And then he said in the middle of a session, she was wondering why there'd just been a little like disappointment or something she couldn't quite read. And he said, well, I've just been thinking about our future together and I love, and I love her and, and all that stuff. And you got to know that before this, he had had in his 20s and early 30s, five women, girlfriends who had cheated on him. That's his background. Came from a pretty secure uh, family of origin, but he had five women that cheated on him. And then his brain is looking out ways I'm going to get cheated on. And he says to his fiance, I know at some point in time, they're going to cheat on me. And I've been trying to figure out how we're going to deal with that when that day comes. And it was like a knife to her heart. He was bringing in all that past pain. And what I often say is when we bring past pain into our life and we're carrying it with us, it often goes underground and comes up as a future negative filter where we expect stuff to happen. Don't know if I can say the other word on this podcast, but we expect it to happen. And when we expect it to happen, we guard against it. And what I said to him, I said, with that attitude, eventually you'll provoke her to do that. We need to work on that. Because he, she was never going to win. And when we ever we bring whatever that past pain in, we look for it and we tend to prod it into existence. And so we've got to clear up that past pain, give it back. And I know in my own life, I've been right there. There was a time that I, I remember the first time I was in a relationship that I had been cheated on. And it was so painful. This was many, many, many years ago. And my next girlfriend was a beautiful woman. And I walk into the house and I see a plumber. 
and immediately, oh my God, I inside I saw red. Popped an attitude. He leaves after he finishes. And she turns and says to me, Gary, I don't deserve that. I don't deserve to pay for your ex-wife. I've been, you are only the fourth man I've been with in my life. I have never cheated on anybody and I don't deserve this. And when I looked at the pain in her eyes of being accused of something she had never and would never do, I said, you're absolutely right. You don't deserve this. Later on, after we talked that through, she says, okay, come on, let's go and make love. <laughs> And I said, why? She goes, why should I? She says, we worked it through. Why should I deprive myself? Now, if I hadn't made that repair, do you think we would have slept together that day? Do you think she would have continued it? No, she was very serious. I don't deserve. And a lot of times, both men and women, we carry that pain in. The next pays for the ex. And pretty soon we wonder why we're on a groundhog day of the same thing happening over and over. We either pick someone to do it. We prod someone to do it or we project it. And it's no way to live. We've got to clean up that past pain. So we're not projecting and prodding like that. Well, projection is the first word that came to mind as you were talking about that phenomenon. Yes. And it seems like this projection just becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, doesn't it? That which I fear is most likely to come to pass. I tell guys who are fearing loss in relationships all the time that eventually they are indeed going to lose her because that's what they keep projecting on the situation. And the nature between masculine leadership and the awakening or ignition of femininity makes it so. Not that it's a gender specific thing. Obviously, women can project onto men and that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy also. But when you are the provider, protector, uh, laying the groundwork in a relationship so a woman feels free to express her feminine to you and that dance can proceed in a healthy, dare I say, normal manner, the more we try to sabotage that with our own feelings, our own fears, the more likely the bad stuff is to come to pass. So as we talked in this show one time when uh, I had another guest on, Alex Allman, and we tried to define what love is, both of us somewhat independently came to the same conclusion ahead of recording that show. And the interesting part about that episode, if you guys have listened to it, is we kind of missed each other on separate paths for a while there in the show, only to arrive at the same conclusion. And that conclusion was love can best be defined as the absence of fear. And as Eastern and woo-woo as that sounds, if you really break down the nature of emotion uh, into two polar opposites, which is loving something and fearing something, I really am unable to love another human being until I stop fearing her or fearing that love or fearing myself, not trusting myself, not liking myself. And, you know, fear is based on ignorance, a lack of understanding something that makes us be afraid of it. And when we're afraid of something, we certainly don't like it. And I've talked at length on this show how that really is the root process of systemic racism and uh, misogyny and all sorts of ways human beings can't stand each other and try to impede each other's progress in this world. So we got to stop being so blasted afraid of everything. Then and only then we can start letting the love come in. So very interesting conversation. And what's the antidote to fear? See, I don't think that love is the absence of fear. Because nature abhors a vacuum. I think love is the presence of four feelings. Love is four simple feelings that are expressed in the most earthly of ways. Welcomed with joy. Hey, baby. Good morning. You know, good morning, gorgeous. That sort of thing. And it's also worthy and nourished. Worthy and nourished is, honey, what do you need today? And when they reach out, you make sure you're tracking what they need. And you can reach out to have your needs met, too. It's cherished and protected. And this is a big one for women. Cherished is that you see an essence in them that you can't get elsewhere. Maybe you can find someone else who's just as good looking or this four foot three or five foot three, I should say, or whatever. But there is an essence to that woman that you can't get elsewhere and you protect it and then empowered with choice. Now, the same goes for us. When people feel truly welcomed and they are welcomed in, in that relationship and they are worthy to have their needs met and they feel cherished and protected, which means they 
feel they can depend on each other. Someone's going to have their back and they feel empowered to have a voice and choice. How, what's the likelihood that there's going to be fear in a relationship where two people give those four feelings? The antidote for fear is one, to face it, but to make sure that both people in that relationship are open to receiving and giving those four feelings. When people feel welcomed, worthy, cherished, and empowered, there's not a lot to fear in that relationship. And when you put those four together and you have a real we, not just two me's who are saying, are we getting our needs met? But there's a we, that's an intermingling and a sharing of purpose and a sharing of influence. And they really step into each other's minds so they get what drives each of them, what most of them, what each of them needs the most. That is that we and those four feelings will drive out fear every time. Yeah, they get each other, <laughs> which is something we talk about around here. You know, if you boil down everything you just discussed, it's safety. We're mutually making each other feel safe and comfortable in this relationship. And when you feel safe, you're by definition not afraid of much. You know, you're not drowning in fear and worry. You feel like, well, you're at home. I once told my wife that early in our relationship. I said, you know, it's so strange, Emily. I feel like I'm at home in this relationship. She was, that's exactly how I feel. Why? Because we got each other. <laughs> so of course we both felt like we were home. And of course, home should be where you feel safe, right? Unfortunately, it isn't for some couples and for some children growing up, but conceptually, at least it works. His name is Dr. Gary Salyer. He is the author of Safe to Love Again, How to Release the Pain of Past Relationships and Create the Love You Deserve. And what I've done is I've set up a special link. Gary's actually the first guy named Gary we've ever had on this show after all these years. So you can go to mountaintoppodcast.com front slash Gary, G-A-R-Y, and that will transport you to the amazon.com link where you can get yourself a copy of Gary's book. Similarly, I have also added Gary's book to the top of my Amazon queue at mountaintoppodcast.com front slash Amazon, where you can find Dr. Gary Sawyer's book, along with all the other books by famous and influential and certainly interesting authors that we have had on our show. Gary, what a great conversation. Thank you for your work, everything you do, and for being on this show with us today. And Scott, thank you. It's an honor to be here with you. You have a beautiful spirit, and it's also an honor to be with all of the men who are listening on this podcast. Indeed. You know, I often feel like it's an honor to have this microphone and this audience to speak to. And guys, on behalf of Dr. Gary Salyer, we certainly appreciate all of you. And Gary, I do appreciate you being on the show here also. Uh, thank you very much, sir. And guys, listen, perhaps you've been burned by a woman in the past. Perhaps you've been cheated on. Perhaps there's this pattern going on in your life. Maybe you can't even put your finger on it, but you're starting to develop this bitterness towards women. You're starting not to trust women at all anymore. Maybe you're starting to project some of the things that went on in past painful relationships onto women at large, and you don't like that feeling. You want out from under it. You want to discover how to love women again and finally invite the right one into your life. Listen, guys, this is self-work you can do. This is something that you can take an interest in. You can write this ship. You can take control, complete ownership and responsibility for what's going on in your life. Start seeing this forest for the trees. The change in self-talk, the change in attitudes will change how you lead with women. And you can indeed start seeing a very real sea change in how women treat you. Talk to me, gentlemen. Some of you are still on the fence about this. You can get on my calendar for free. We'll talk for 25 minutes, 30, 35 minutes or more if we have to, to figure out how to put a plan in place where you start getting what you want. I talk about deserving what you want. If you know you want to deserve what you want, guess what? You're already on the right track. It all starts with talking to me. You can go to mountaintoppodcast.com, sign up for free, won't cost you a dime. Scheduling is at your convenience, and let's make this happen. Guys, if you are not really all that familiar with our work around here yet, listen to a few more episodes of this podcast, sign up for my free newsletter, which will come to you fluff free every day with actionable steps to get better with women in your life. You can sign up for that by going to mountaintoppodcast.com as well. 
While you're at the website, guys, don't forget to look up our sponsors, our generous sponsors of this show who have supported us for well over a year now, including Origin in Maine and HeroSoap.com. Both of those are great companies that give back to our veterans and are all about masculinity and doing right in the world and certainly doing right by their customers. Use the coupon code MOUNTAIN10 with either one of our sponsors, Origin in Maine or Hero Soap, to get an additional 10% off your order. And until I talk to you again soon, this is Scott McKay from X and Y Communications in San Antonio, Texas. Be good out there. The Mountaintop Podcast is produced by X and Y Communications. All rights reserved worldwide. Be sure to visit www.mountaintoppodcast.com for show notes. And while you're there, sign up for the free X and Y Communications newsletter for men. This is Ed Roy Odom speaking for The Mountaintop Podcast.